Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Ladies and gentlemen, wherever you are in the world, welcome back to The Caring Economy with me, Toby Usnick. Today I have as my guest, Emily Rasmussen, who is the founder and CEO of Grapevine, the collective giving platform. And we'll talk about giving platforms today. Grapevine is the only platform dedicated to giving circles with 50,000 plus members, more than 800 active giving circles, and over $22 million raised to date. Previously, Emily was the founding executive director of NYU, the New York University's Center for Ballet and the Arts. She launched the Lincoln Center at the Movies Global Media Initiative, and she developed innovative financing models for impact at enterprise solutions to poverty. Emily has consulted on event cinema for Disney Theatrical Group, taught creative and cultural entrepreneurship at SUNY Purchase, and spent two years developing microfinance and fair trade programs in India. She's a board member of the Harvard Business School Women's Association, a member of LISC's Emerging Leaders Council, the After Arts Group, Nova Impact, and a founding member of Untitled, an arts and business innovative initiative. And if that's not enough, previously she was actually a professional ballet dancer and performed with the Pacific Northwest Ballet, among others. Emily holds a BA from Occidental College in Diplomacy and World Affairs and Economics, and an MBA from, yes, you know it, Harvard Business School. Emily, welcome to The Caring Economy. Thank you so much, Toby. It's great to be here. So what a fantastic journey you've had. How does one go from dancing to philanthropy and social impact? Can you give us like a, a two or a four minute digest of your life where you grew up, how you found your way and so forth? I think it started, uh, I actually grew up being homeschooled in a log cabin in the mountains that my parents built. So it started with a little bit of an unconventional um, beginning and uh, was always encouraged to pursue whatever interested me. And so <laughs> I think you can see that throughout my my career path, uh, but did pursue ballet and, and did that for a while and danced in Seattle at the company there. The thing that really kind of accelerated, I would say, my transition to college and pursuing a different career path, which I always knew at some point I wanted to do after I was done with my, my dancing mm -hmm. um, part of my career was 9-11 happened. And it just really, for me, was a moment to reflect on uh, what I wanted to focus on and what was interesting me in the world at that time. And so that's what got me um, focused on school and going to Occidental College to learn about diplomacy, world affairs. And I was able to spend some time at the United Nations as an intern during that undergraduate degree. Mm -hmm. And that's what set me on this path of microfinance and, and working um, in this community-based financing field. I want to go back. First of all, where was the log cabin? Uh, in California, Northern California. Yeah. I'm impressed with the success of homeschooled students that I have seen through the years. Not many, but the few I've gotten known. And it, when I was coming up, it seemed almost heretical, you know, like isolationists went off the reservation. But but what was that experience like for you? And are, are you one of are you one of several children or an only child? And then thirdly, how do you think it's made a difference in your trajectory? So I'm one of two children. So I did have an older brother and he was only a year and a half or is only a year and a half older. And so we were very close. And uh, so it was nice to be able to go through that experience with him. You know, I think for us, we did, we went to school in elementary school. So we started homeschooling the end of sixth grade. Mm -hmm. And for me, school was was good, but also a bit of a frustrating experience. And uh, I ended up actually skipping a grade in the school that I was in. And it was just a smaller school that um, didn't have as many resources. It just wasn't the the experience that I was hoping for, I guess, and that my parents saw that I needed. And so um, they opened up this opportunity and it seemed like what a cool thing to get to do. And my mom was a librarian and my grandmother was an English teacher. And so they just pretty much surrounded us with books. They didn't, we didn't sit down and do schooling at home. It was anything that we expressed an interest in. My mom would go to the library and come home with five or 10 or 20 books on the topic and hope one or a couple of them, um, you know, struck an interest and, and that we would pick them up. So it was very, my mom liked to call it unschooling. <laughs> the fact that I did go to, through school for a period of time was, was helpful and that I understood what that experience was like. And I think also uh, my family was very social outside of school. So I still played sports. I went to ballet classes. I was getting into that more. So I still had a very kind of socially connected life. People who are homeschooled maybe don't have as much. And and um, so I was fortunate to have that. And it, it kind of came together in a way that 
prepared me enough, but not too much, I guess, for what was next, left it pretty open for me to chart my own path. And in California, does one take, like here in New York State, we have the Regents exam. Do you, are you, there's standardized tests that you take to make sure you're getting your maths and science and all of that as well? So actually in California, and I'm not sure if it's the same way now, but California was very flexible with this. So we were not required uh, hmm. to do any testing from what I recall or, or any kind of check-in with with a, a charter school, for example, like other states would require homeschooled mm -hmm. uh, kids to do. So we did do some of that for the first couple of years. I think my parents were a little nervous that they might really mess us up. Um, so we did those occasional check-ins with the charter school and it just seemed like we were fine and off yeah. and running. And so I think that kind of fell away uh, a couple of years in. How awesome that you end up doing microfinance in your career, yeah. <laughs> even if you weren't, you know, a math major, so to speak. So um, let's talk a little bit about the ballet then before we go into your your more recent chapter. So you obviously had a passion and a gift for ballet. And what made you shift? No, I, it was really 9-11. Uh, but that combined with I did have an injury at the time. And so ended up needing to have surgery and and sitting out for uh, several months, I think four or six months, if I remember correctly. So it was, I was sitting out right at this, right after this 9-11 um, thing had happened. And so it just got me thinking that, okay, when I come back, when I'm ready and I'm healthy, you know, I do want to come back and, and start doing auditions and figuring out where I might want to go next within the ballet world. But I also am really interested in school. I've always known that. And so while I'm sitting here, I might as well start studying and getting ready. And maybe I'll even apply to a few schools and see what happens. Mm -hmm. um, so with that kind of approach, and I ended up getting accepted at Occidental College in LA that had this uh, program at the United Nations that I was really fascinated with at the time. So it just came together. Well, wow. it's there's something you said for serendipity in life, right? Yeah. When you do decide to go in a different career path, was that before the MBA? Did the MBA come later or how does that, that factor in? Yeah, it, it was before the MBA. So it was undergrad, uh, the UN, and then got very interested in microfinance while I was at the UN. That was the year that Muhammad Yunus won um, his uh, big awards. And so that put it on the map for me. And I ended up doing my senior thesis on microfinancing arts and culture, kind of connecting these two different areas of interest for me awesome. uh, and spent some time in India doing that. My senior year was offered a job by a microfinance institution while I was there. And I thought, if not now, when, right? I mean, <laughs> so it was not what I had planned or expected to do. I think I, I, I don't know if I had plans actually looking back on it, any specific ones. I think I was still just getting through school at the time, but it seemed like a great next step and ended up spending over two years in India uh, working there. And it was an amazing experience. I'm so grateful that I took that time. Explain to our listeners, if you would, a little bit about giving platforms and, and what Grapevine is and how maybe it is similar and how it's different. Sure. Yeah. I like to say Grapevine is the first crowd granting platform which is different from what most people think of, I think, when I hear a giving platform, which is more typically crowdfunding platforms. I have the four C's of crowd granting just to kind of boil it down to the basics, which the first C is community, right? So when you are joining a giving circle on um, our platform, you're joining a community of people. Uh, that's first. The second one is collective resources. So you are pooling your donations with others. Uh, but you're often also pooling your knowledge, your networks, your time. Uh, so it's, a, you know, collective resources broadly conceived. Uh, the third one is collaboration. Mm -hmm. So if you were to start a crowdfunding campaign, Toby, I might pitch in some money to your campaign for the cause you care about, right? But it doesn't necessarily mean it's the cause I care about. Um, I don't have any kind of say in where our money goes. Mm -hmm. So in, in crowd granting, the idea is that you pool your money together and then everyone who participates has some say in deciding where that pooled fund goes ultimately. Mm -hmm. The last C is continuation. So instead of this being a one-time crowdfunding campaign, this is about ongoing community building, connecting over time and recurring donation cycles so that you're granting money to many different nonprofits or projects over time and building your community and your impact together. Mm -hmm. So I would imagine baked in all those four phases is an element of learning, sort of continuous learning and, and education for the participants. Yeah, absolutely. There's some great research around 
the value of the giving circle model for participants. And um, it's, it's not only this opportunity to amplify your impact, right? Taking your hundred dollars, pulling it with a hundred other people. Now you have a $10,000 check to give away and you get to be part of that meaningful impact often in your local community or around a particular cause you care about. So that's absolutely there as a key part of the benefit of participating. But what we also find is that these are great ways for people to one, connect, just connect with other like-minded people, other people who care about healthy oceans or care about making Reno, Nevada, a really wonderful community. And um, so whatever the focus may be, you're connecting with these like-minded people and you're also learning from each other. You're learning about other causes and organizations that people in the group care about. They get to share those with you and explain why they think it's important. There's often discussion around um, what we should support. So you get to learn about how other people think about it, as well as what other options are out there. Um, so all of that happens through these groups. And what we tend to see is that the learning that happens has ripple effects of impact because that might inform ultimately what your group supports, but it may also end up informing other things that you support separately, right, on your own. We see people learning about nonprofits through a giving circle getting very excited about them. It strikes a chord for whatever reason. So maybe the group supports them. Maybe they don't that cycle, but then that person may go on to become a volunteer of that nonprofit, um, maybe even a board member, you know, so it can lead to so many other ways that people are able to make an impact. Um, and then the last thing to note is just the community itself we see can lead to great connections and meaning for people, both personally and professionally. So these tend to be more network people, social people, people who care about giving back, being involved civically. And so that can lead to much broader networks um, for the members, mm -hmm. uh, as well as, you know, opportunities for them to give back and support others on their journey. Uh, and it sounds, from the way you're describing it, uh, fairly democratic, that one need not be Richie Rich or, um, you know, fill in the blank billionaire to participate. Is that a fair statement? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So this, this giving circle model uh, really started in the early 80s here in the US, certainly has roots that go back, you know, centuries to other cultures globally, you can think of the Tandas and the Susus, the self help groups of microfinance, right, but this version of it started here in the US in, in the early 80s. Um, and it was really women coming together initially in local communities that said, you know, I don't have that much money. I don't know that much about all the issues, but maybe if we collaborate and we work together. And so what we tend to see is uh, the most popular model is that $100 per quarter model and the, the more traditional giving circle member being more in that mass affluent kind of economic bracket, right? So you're not the high net worth, let alone the ultra high net worth. Uh, these are people who give uh, hundreds or, you know, maybe thousands of dollars away per year. Mm -hmm. um, and what we're seeing as, as the movement has continued to grow and expand over the last several years is that's getting even more diverse. And so what we see on the Grapevine platform is there are more and more groups that are $10 a month or $50 a quarter, right? As well as $10,000 a, a year for some of our groups. So it's really, I think, striking a chord, this model across economic capacity um, mm -hmm. and background. Can you give us a sense of um, demographics? Uh, you're global, I presume, but are you, you know, mostly in the U.S.? Are you mostly in English speaking languages or how does it work? So the movement itself is global, uh, primarily U.S. based, but we do have lots of groups in Canada and China and Colombia and all over the place. Uh, so that's really exciting. And I think it will just continue to, to spread. We Grapevine are currently national. So we have giving circles in every state across the country. As you mentioned in your, your introduction, we have over 800 active giving circles and 50,000 members, uh, but they do need to give to a US-based 501c3 nonprofit. And uh, we're working on on that global expansion of the platform, but uh, but currently, yes, it is focused here nationally. And, and if someone joins um, a giving circle on Grapevine, is it, what do you sort of do on the say in the back end? Are you providing? Um, do you do tax paperwork for them, or or due diligence, or what are some of the benefits? Yeah, that's a great question. So we we like to say we're an all in one solution for giving circles. 
I mean, you think about the model, it's a simple concept, right? A group of people mm -hmm. come together, they pull money, they give back. But if you imagine this one very popular model I shared, a hundred people coming together, everyone pitches in a hundred dollars, that's a lot of checks to handle every quarter. And if you don't have a place to hold that money, right, who's collecting that money? And now who's going to drive that money down to the nonprofit? Mm -hmm. um, it, it's actually quite a lot just on the payment side of things, let alone issuing tax receipts and coordinating with 100 people when our next event is and all of that. So what we found is that uh, this model really didn't have a solution that was designed specifically for them. And they were trying to piece together different things, whether it was a community foundation DAF account with a you know Excel spreadsheet or a MailChimp account, um, Facebook group. So now with Grapevine, what you can do is in just a couple of minutes, you can set up your own giving circle on Grapevine. And that essentially gives you a community space where mm -hmm. you can invite members in to join the group. They can make their donations into your shared charitable pool and we'll send them their tax receipts on your behalf. And then we'll hold on to that money until your group decides where to send it and you let us know, then we'll grant that money in one big check or ACH payment to the nonprofit you've selected. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, you have this community space where you can invite members into the group, you can coordinate and communicate with each other. There are even features in there specific to the Giving Circle model where you can request members to nominate nonprofits for the group to consider or vote on nonprofits um, organize events, all the things that we see giving circles typically need to run their model, whether it's the donation um, payment side of things or the communication and collaboration side of things. Mm -hmm. So uh, if someone wants to check you out, what's the best way to find Grapevine? Grapevine.org. Okay. And if someone um, wants to follow up with you, should it be through the website or through LinkedIn or Twitter? Or... Yeah. I mean, you can find us at Grapevine Giving on Pretty much all the socials so definitely follow us there uh info at grapevine.org is a great email if you want to reach out directly and um you can find us that way um grapevine.org there's there's a place there you can sign up for our newsletter so you can stay up to date on all the good things that we're doing and um if you follow us on on the socials you'll see there's lots of great activity from our community um in those places too which awesome. is kind of a fun way to stay up to date and, and a moment ago, you had mentioned Mailchimp and Facebook. Uh, it, does the platform allow people to have a pre-existing circle to port it over fairly easily technologically? Absolutely, yeah. And in fact, Toby, that's how we got started. We launched Giving Circles on Grapevine in March of 2020, which, as you probably recall, was an interesting time um, for all of us heading into COVID. And so, all of these existing Giving Circles that were meeting in person, doing things offline suddenly needed an online solution to continue to do their work during a time where we really needed them to continue to give back to their communities. Mm -hmm. And so our first um, focus was just on getting those existing giving circles onto the platform. So it's very easy for an existing group to just go and set up your Grapevine page for your giving circle, uh, add in all of your members and um, do all of that quite simply. We have uh, weekly demos and office hours as well, where we can walk you through that step-by-step. So okay. yeah, it's definitely all, all built for existing groups or for new groups just getting started. Ladies and gentlemen, again today on The Caring Economy, we have as our guest, Emily Rasmussen. She's the founder and CEO of Grapevine, which is the collective giving platform with over 50,000 members globally and 800 active circles. Emily, I wonder if you could give us a little bit of um, trend analysis, what you've seen. It could either be in your whole career because you've been at this a while, or it could just be in the past few years. Are you seeing that... Um, you know, now that we're coming out of COVID, that um, the focus on healthcare has gone down, or is it still holding steady? Is it our church groups up, or is food relief important? What kinds of things are you seeing? Gosh, when I think about the the causes that our our giving circles are supporting, it's wide ranging. And I think during COVID, we definitely saw much more of a focus on immediate needs, critical needs in the community, food mm -hmm. and um, you know other things to keep people safe, health care, as you mentioned, and and um, safe and healthy. Mm -hmm. um, so there was definitely a, a kind of narrowing of the focus around that. And, and that was when we were just getting started. So that's kind of the baseline that we had. Mm -hmm. I would say over the last year, uh, we have started to see that open up more. And I think we're seeing just a broader range of community-based initiatives being supported. In general, the Giving Circle model is very strong for supporting the smaller, more local, more grassroots organizations that 
are in our communities uh, that we often, you wouldn't find if you know you were online or you were looking um, at some of the ratings agencies, but through word of mouth, through this community, you can surface these things in a really meaningful way and end up finding groups that are smaller and where your dollar goes further. Um, and so I would say that's always kind of been the through line that we've seen with our groups. But uh, as far as different cause area trends since since the COVID times, I, I do see more education now. I see quite a bit of women and girls um, mm. cause area or, or you know, organizations focused on those communities. Mm -hmm. And that's not surprising. As I mentioned before, women are still the majority of the members in giving circles. And we know that women tend to give to women and girls issues much more often than, than men do. And so, um, you know, this is a powerful model just in that, that it's engaging a broader range, broader diversity of donors with different perspectives that fund different things than some of the more traditional large-scale philanthropists that we think mm -hmm. of. Um, so yeah, I, I would say it's just broadening. I no particular uh, you know, sector or cause area, I would say more than others, but I'm seeing arts, education, uh, just uh, animals, climate justice. I think there's a real community-based mm -hmm. movement around climate justice things where you have these smaller organizations doing meaningful work on that topic, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to some of the really big ones trying to address some of the really big issues. Yeah. Uh, a broad range of things now. I've talked with a number of guests in the past in the philanthropy and social impact space about um, the wealth transfer that's going on, the greatest wealth transfer in history. And I would think that Grapevine probably is a wonderful teaching platform as well to have multi-generational collaboration, a mother, daughter, or father, son, or you know, grandparent could sit down and, and really engage with various family members about not just where's the money going, but why is it going there and, and having a say in it. Is that, does that does it get used that way often, the platform? It does, yeah. And I would say um, it's a, it's more recent that we're starting to see that just organically bubbling up. And it makes perfect sense, right? At the end of the day, we are the best place for group giving. If you want to give as a group, whether you're a family or a book club or a neighborhood or a, a group of people who care about a particular cause, right? This is this kind of community-based collaborative way to give together. And so we are starting to see that. In fact, we're seeing philanthropic advisors sending clients of theirs who say, oh, I wanna give with my family. How do I do that? They're sending people sure. our way now. People are learning about it and finding these other um, communities you know, to, to start groups with. So it's certainly something that we're, we're seeing, but very excited to start to see that pick up even more, more and more awareness. Yeah, very exciting. I'm just thinking out loud now. I'm, my husband's from Texas. I don't know if you ever saw Friday Night Lights, but you know the whole football fandom there. I'm wondering if you have <laughs> sports groups at high schools that are, or parents of sports players that are creating mm -hmm. circles. Is that a little too niche? There's a lot of interesting energy in that space right now, Toby, which I'm just learning. I, I must admit, I'm not the biggest sports fan. Um, so it's it's newer to me, but we do have some things percolating in that space, uh, newer, but uh, but yeah, there's some interesting energy there. So hopefully we'll have some more examples. I know how rabid the fan base is. And so it's an exciting idea, right? Because when you think about this movement, as I mentioned, there are these more typical models, a hundred people, a hundred dollars each, and we're giving back to our local community in Reno. But then you have those smaller ones, like the family and friends groups I mentioned, or the book clubs. But then we are also seeing some of these much larger ones. So uh, that are almost thought leader or influencer led, right? And one example of that is Edgar Villanueva. He wrote the book, Decolonizing Wealth. I'm sure you and your, your um, listeners have heard of him. He's doing great work supporting Native American communities. He runs a giving circle on Grapevine and his group has engaged thousands of members and they've moved millions of dollars, right? And he's been able to build this community of people um, that has now spawned like book clubs and all of these other events and things around this cause and his work, including raising millions of dollars and unlocking much larger capital from foundations to match that. To this cause so exactly so when you think about someone who's a thought leader or even just an influencer with you know a broader reach and audience this model can be extremely powerful to to mm -hmm. unlock a lot of um funding and impact i would i would absolutely believe that because then what you're doing is you're giving grading you're giving greater convening power to the participants on whatever the topic is so when the collective knocks on a company's door or a perhaps a a legislator's door, they're more likely to take the call than if it's just the individual. 
I think that's right. And and even foundations or individual philanthropists that might have larger pools of capital to put to work when they see this kind of groundswell of interest and support, I think that's a, a great seal of approval, right? Um, for them to say, wow, there's there's something real here for us to get behind and, and add our camp capital to amplify that impact. Yeah. Um, and also when I think about like the sports model, um, you know, we all in high school, you played sports, you said, you know, you'd have the fundraisers, right? You'd do a bake sale or whatever to raise some money for equipment or what have you. But it was kind of a one off, right? But with the giving circle, you can be a little bit more strategic. You can have institutional knowledge, you can have goals, information sharing, so that it's not a one off, it would seem to me. So I, I would like to think that that's an area of growth for you potentially. I think absolutely. It's a great concept, right? Instead of us trying to throw out another crowdfunding campaign every six months for something else, why don't we just join this community and keep pooling funds into our fund? And now we know we just, we've all committed to, to building this fund that's going to support our different things. And we'll work together to decide what, when the time comes, but we have that to work with. We don't have to launch something new every single time. Absolutely. And then that could bring, I mean, I, then my mind races with Boy Scouts and Girl, Girl Scouts and all the different fundraising groups. You could also be a sort of, maybe you are, what do you want to call it? A, not a, in Vanity Press would be in publishing when you do the publishing for a company, but you could be the back engine for probably any number of corporations that want um, employee engagement around philanthropy and social impact. But it's such a great, Yes, I totally agree with you. It's funny, we have had some companies find us and say, this is so great because it's it's a, it's a the best way to build engagement and connection between our team members while giving back and making a difference. Yeah. And it's not some big overly developed, uh, you know, payroll processing tool that's going to cost us $30,000 a year. It's like, no, this is about just coming together as a community and connecting together, learning about what each other cares about and giving back as a collective. And so we've started to see teams, employee resource groups uh, using Grapevine as a way to do that. So I'm hoping we'll continue to see that that bubbling up and maybe even get some of these companies to say, hey, why don't we why don't we set up a whole network of giving circles for our, our teams or our customers yeah. across the country, right? Yeah, it could be a bespoke service offering. I would imagine though that there are still already organizations out there that are knocking on your doors because they know that you have access to these organizations, these groups, these passionate groups and these funds. So are there are there organizations come you don't have to name names but I would are they courting you because of who you are? We have a lot of people who want to share things with our community more about the great things that they're doing and it's one of the challenges for us I think as we think about the next stage right we we want to be very we want to make sure that this experience is a high value meaningful experience for each of our community members and each of these groups so we're very protective of that. At the same time, I think there are opportunities for us to collaborate with others to bring more value, but it has to be done in a really thoughtful way. Um, but yes, we we do have a number of conversations with others about that. Yeah, I mean, I'm just thinking out loud now. I could imagine like you could have both UBS and JP Morgan wanting you to give their wealth report to your members. And then you have to remain objective and not be endorsing or perceived as endorsing one or the other. So that's probably where it's better left that you're the members bring it into the circle rather than you, but <laughs> right. you're throw in popularity, I'm sure. <laughs> so uh, just one last question for you, Emily, which is one I always ask my guests, which is sort of the pearls of wisdom. What, what have you gleaned in your career, in your life? You've got this purpose-driven career. Um, it all makes sense in the rear view mirror, but you've had some moves along the way that you've shared with us today. Are there any particular lessons you'd like to share either with young professionals who are studying out or even older folks who've been perhaps disrupted or questioning what they're doing right now and maybe wanting to pivot. I think this general approach from from growing up around just find your own path and and don't be afraid of that. That's the best path in a way. Um, and so I, that I will say that over time, I've had moments where I've questioned that and thought, oh my gosh, I remember looking at my resume at one point and thinking, I feel like someone would look at this and think, oh, I might want to have a coffee with this person to have a chat, but what would I ever hire them to do? You know, and so there's definitely those moments where you, you kind of think, oh gosh, what, what path am I on? And even now, I mean, we'll, you know, we're on such a great path and journey with Grapevine, but uh, 
these, you know, we're still, we're still in the thick of it. So a couple of things that jump out at me um, that have been helpful for me at different moments. And one is I always knew I wanted to start something and specifically a social enterprise, something that was impactful. And I was really passionate about the community-based stuff. So when I left my last job, I didn't know exactly what Grapevine was going to be. It was a little too early, frankly, for me to leave a job at that point, but but it was the right moment in some ways because I needed to either make a commitment to stay on for a while longer or transition. And I just remember thinking, if not now, when, mm-hmm. right? And, and that has come up for me a number of times. So there's something that I want to do and I can't, I, it's not fully fleshed out yet, but you know, now, now seems to be the time. And if, if not, then maybe never. Um, so that's one that I think has, has rung true for me at many points in my career. And another one is a, a good friend and advisor said to me once, well, you might as well bet on yourself. And I think <laughs> what we've all experienced in the last few years, right, is that who knows the world, who knows anything can happen. And yeah. I think sometimes we make these decisions that feel like the safe decision or the right decision or whatever it is. And that's just really hard to know anymore. Um, and so you might as well bet on yourself, whatever that means for you. I don't know, but that's been helpful for me. That's very helpful. I must say you exude this confidence that I I, I have a hard time believing there ever, was ever a moment in your life where you were shaking your boots with fear for like, oh my oh God, my God. <laughs> you. but instead we're perhaps right. a bit more just curious about the path that you were defining. But let me assure you many, <laughs> many times. <laughs> well, Emily Rasmussen, thank you so much for joining us today. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest is the CEO and founder of Grapevine, the global collective giving platform with over 50,000 members and 800 active circles having raised $22 million to date. If you want to be in touch, check them out, grapevine.org. O-R-G. Thank you, Emily. I hope you'll come back and tell us about the next 22 million. (laughs) Thank you, Toby.